could you just give us an overview of the current situation when it comes to highly pathogenic avian influenza, influenza or H5N1, where we stand as of um, Monday, April 29th? Things are moving along pretty quickly, and I think after um, really recognizing this undiagnosed morbidity event in dairy cows, probably end of January, early February, and then having working groups starting in early March and, and the diagnosis there in the in the middle to end of March, I think the current standing of where we are with H5N1 is we have a federal order for interstate movement of, of lactating dairy cattle, and the current kind of number of states, I think, is up to nine uh, with uh, more than 30 dairies. But I, I don't know how accurate that is because it's not requ required to be um, to report. So I think that number will probably climb, um, but that, that shouldn't really surprise anyone. There's obviously been a lot of information out there, a lot of different resources and things thrown at dairy farmers. If you were to identify the few or handful of most important things for dairy farmers to know and consider about the situation, what would those be, Keith? Our top three talking points, really the most important part, and I know that there were some stories from the FDA last week, is that pasteurized milk products and pasteurized dairy products are safe. Um, we can find uh, little bits of RNA in there with a PCR machine um, in pasteurized products, but that really it does not mean that milk is infective. So that's a number one thing that we need to make sure that the consumers and everyone on the local level understand um, because the news stories can be kind of confusing. The second part is, is that cows really don't have a high mortality rate. Cows aren't dying at the same rate that uh, domestic poultry would. Now that doesn't mean, and I don't wanna discount the fact that cows do get sick. And it uh, working through and talking to veterinarians and producers on the front line, um, those cows are sick. They, you know, they have a fever, they're dehydrated, they drop in milk production. Same as when you know I bring my kids home from daycare and they feel terrible and then I feel terrible. You know, so it, you know, we don't want to discount that. And it does have a significant economic impact. So our and our third most important point is really our message to farmers as well of this isn't a a current high threat to public health, but the longer that we deal with a lot of environment virus in the environment, um, we know that flu viruses change and they change readily. That's why we have different uh, flu vaccines uh, every every season. Is that we don't want this to go to to the virus to change to be able to be passed from human to human. We think that is a very low but not zero risk. And the longer that there's a lot of virus uh, circulating around the country, the higher that risk becomes. Could you expand a little bit or give an overview of the recent announcement regarding the the federal movement restriction, um, and then also a few guidelines or tips um, mm -hmm. what farmers should do to make sure that they're they're following that correctly. The federal order really focuses on lactating cows, and we recognize that as probably the, our biggest risk factor of cows that are moving around the country. Very very specific business models, or if if cows are moving uh, for sale or to slaughter. Um, and that's really where USDA is going to start. We don't, we can't test every cow um, because you, when you think about the logistics of even just labeling tubes and having the, the paperwork that goes along with it, or can we just barcode things? You know, we can't all of a sudden say we're going to test all 50,000 animals that are moving. That would really be a problem with our supply chain on reagents, the labs workflows, because the labs are, we, you know, we still have all of our other work that that's going on. Um, and so then really, that's what really led to the 30 animals uh, of a shipment or more. So they're looking at, you know, even though we know that 30 animals um, probably isn't representative of all the animals in that shipment, we have to start somewhere and then it will help us really give more data. So then we know exactly how many animals we need to test in a population, how that will work. Uh, um, and those animals right now are being required to test seven days before they move. And a lot of that is for lab turnaround time. And then the big exemption from those that federal order is animals that are going to slaughter. So those animals that are going into the food chain, really, they don't require that testing. What If you have questions, contact your veterinarian. If your veterinarian has questions, call the lab. The lab can figure it out. Um, and if they don't have that answer, their state animal health official or their state department of animal health will have the order as well. And in constant, we're working together all the time. Right before I was talking to you, I was talking to our state veterinarian about, hey, what do you think about this? 
What do you think about that? How can we get testing kits out there? Um, because the USDA is paying for all the testing, surveillance, movement, anything you're looking for, the USDA will pay for it. What they don't pay for is the labor to take those samples yet. I do see some sort of, of change on that in the future, but not at this at, not at this time. We learned that in pseudo rabies eradication that you needed to pay for labor, labor right? Because it, it's not free. Um, but right now, APHIS doesn't have that funding approved by Congress. Um, so any uh, Holstein Association member, if you want to get on the horn with your congressman um, or senator, would be great to say, hey, they need some money to pay the veterinarians to do this. Um, because the, the industry is losing money already due to this and milk prices have been low. But to have federal funding to be able to do that is, is important. So call your vet call the state animal health department and we can certainly work it out. But here's a kind of key point there. Don't wait for the day before. I'm, I'm fairly confident that a lot of labs that see high volumes in our dairy states will be able to have, a, you know, a 24 hour to 36 hour turnaround time. But I don't really know what that sample volume is going to be. Um, so it, it, that might change over time. And we're talking to our clients on a regular basis, just to make sure that we can provide the best customer service that we can. Could you expand a little bit on um, what the virus looks like as it goes through the cow and as it um, affects them and then what the recovery process looks like uh, for them as well? The best case definition of what we have is odd. It's not what we typically think about with infectious diseases in dairy farms. Typically we're dealing with infectious diseases in calves and or transition cows, right? Because they're stressed or they don't have a great immune system as a calf. This is different. So usually the case definition that affects most farms or what we see would be second lactation or greater. Um, so we're, you know, the three and four year olds. And then they're usually 150 days of milk or more. So they're coming off peak going in to mid and end of lactation. We do know that uh, fresh heifers, which are our primary reason or our primary cause of virus being spread across the country, are shedding virus and they typically have very um, mild clinical signs or no clinical signs. So in those cows and in that population of our second lactation or greater 150 days of milk, it's about 10% of that group that will of those cows that will get sick. So, and the peak incidence on a farm is actually pretty quick. It's about four to six days after they find their first cow. Those cows are typically found with um, their rumination monitors will drop or their pedometer activity will drop. And then um, as their feed intake drops, their milk drops as well. And they we're seeing a pretty significant milk drop. The milk might change colors. It might be more, look more like colostrum and be more viscous. Um, and so, and then those cows will have a fever as well. Usually we, when we as associate influenza with a GI disease, it's usually diarrhea. But in this case, we might see some loose stool in the beginning, but then we are seeing kind of more like dry cow consistency feces, um, where it's kind of dry and tacky, most likely because they're dehydrated, just like a, a person with influenza. Could you provide any insight or just help from my understanding of why right now lactating cows are the only ones that um, are requiring testing for movement? Yeah. So lack, the reason why lactating cows and, you know, when we talked about that, that uh, case definition, right, of here's the cows that we're typically seeing, but we know that uh, lactating fresh two-year-olds are, are, you know, our fresh two-year-olds are fresh heifers. They are shedding virus at a much lower rate of clinical signs, but they do still have virus. And that's what's so odd is that, you you know, having a very specific population of just lactating cows and we know that virus is tropic for the mammary tissue. We don't know why, but it is tropic for mammary tissue. So we tend to see a lot of virus in the udder and then it's shed into milk. We know that on those affected cows that we can see positive PCR results in their milk. Um, the rest of the typical samples that we take are not very consistent. So typically when you think about a flu or let's say a mycoplasma bovis in calves, we do nasal swabs or we do deep nasal pharyngeal swabs, and those are not very accurate. I know that USDA has them as an, uh, an approved sample type to do for non-lactating animals, but they're just not very sensitive. Even in our lactating cows, they just don't shed a lot of virus in their nasal secretions. Um, and then it's the same with feces and urine. 
that we just don't see a lot of it. We do see more in urine than feces, um, but urine is kind of a difficult uh, thing to you know collect uh, repeatedly versus milk. So that's why we're really focusing on those lactating cows. We do have blood tests available um, and we're, we're adapting and validating those commercially available kits um, that we have for poultry um, to, to use in cattle. And we, we're still looking at that data. So they, they are performing quite well. Um, but we really need to dial that in and, and our partners at the National Animal Health Laboratory Network and the National Veterinary Services Laboratory are, are working really hard. A lot of different labs, like we tested a couple thousand samples uh, from our inventory to help them with that validation. I'm hoping that we get good guidance maybe end of this week or early next week because the blood is another sample that's easy uh, to, to collect, um, easier to collect whenever you want. You don't have to wait for a cow to urinate. Um, and, um, it can help us to see whether or not a cow has been exposed and mounted an, an immune response because we're testing for antibody. Is there any information yet about how, um, the cows may be affected from the long term if they come down with, with avian influenza and recover, or is it really too early to, to draw any conclusions on that? I think right now, preliminary data suggests just like people with influenza, um, is that once they recover, they have pretty good um, exposure immunity. And we are seeing that. We're seeing antibody responses in cows. I wouldn't expect it to have issues on long-term with whether that's fertility or or production. But granted, we're only two months into this. But I, if it follows other influences, it really shouldn't have long-term impacts. What are some of the, the key biosecurity measures um, that farmers should be be taking serious and considering? Um, the first thing to think about with biosecurity and biosafety is just to start thinking about if you want to keep something off your farm, how would you do that? And how then, if you had an issue, how do you not want to infect your neighbors, right? Same as uh, whether there's diagnostic testing and or, you know, keeping cows on the farm or having specific dedicated footwear. Now, there's specific guidelines on USDA's website, but uh, the National Milk Producers Federation with uh, Preventalytics was able to take that and really kind of take those uh, recommendations and really refine them specifically to H5N1. And they can be found on the NMPF website. We link to them on our website and AABP has them as well. And I think AVMA does as well. So you should be able to find the H5N1 specific biosecurity and then biosafety, you know, you're looking at those are pretty much uh, gold best standard or best practices of having dedicated footwear that you can then disinfect between barns um, or just disinfect of any visitor coming onto your farm and then disinfect going off and then having dedicated um, uh, farm clothing. I don't know that we really need to get into the shower in, shower out of some of our swine facilities. I think on the farm, it's really difficult once disease uh, spread starts that you can do anything about it because the cows do shed quite a bit in their milk. And you, we can't sanitize the milking claw between each cow. We do the best we can with pre and post dips, um, but realistically it, that, that's pretty challenging. And I think we're gonna find and with some more study about what other potential risks that we could see, which I, you know, th there's a good and a bad part about this. The bad part is that, you know, cows are sick and we're seeing production loss, but the good part is, is that it does really prepare the dairy industry for future outbreaks um, for other um, consequential diseases like foot and mouth disease, if that were to be a problem. Um, and that will give them more experience about how to have more biosecure um, and biosafe uh, places to work and to really, and that I think in the long term, that will really help the longevity and sustainability of the industry over time. Can you talk a little bit to the importance of proper animal identification and traceability um, and how things like that can help to, to mitigate and potentially prevent the spread of this as well, or just help farmers uh, manage things within their own herd better as well? So many of us use, you know, 840 tags or, or per, uh, permanent identification from being a calf. We can use them in the, the parlors to understand where the animals are. And then as they move around, because we have, you know, thousands of animals on the trucks right now. And we think that that could be anywhere from 30 to 50,000 lactating head moving per week. 
and we're looking at you know upwards of seventy to eighty thousand cows going to um, into the food chain per week. So that traceability back to really understand the epidemiology when we start seeing a problem is really important. Now there's a, a, a trade off to that because you know, it, then the data is connected. It makes it very easy to trace diseases back. But then again, then there's a, a privacy concern on those animal owners. But I can say as a scientist and a public health person, it protects the entire industry to know where the where cows are going and how can we institute changes upstream to really prevent or mitigate problems way downstream. And that really helps with uh, consumer uh, confidence, because we know we're, that we're making a, a safe and wholesome product. And this really helps us identify problems early. So then we don't really need or we, we don't end up in the in the problems that we're in right now. So contacting your uh, for permanent identification, the livestock identification consortiums, it's absolutely required if you're moving animals interstate, specifically with our current federal order, understanding do you have your premises ID and then do you have um, USDA approved unique identification of those animals um, to really help us link up the, the testing and then the epidemiology to really have our um, long-term improvements down, down, down the road. Do you have any um, indication on how this might Im start impacting dairy cattle shows or sales or things like that? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, our our colleagues in the swine industry and poultry have been dealing with different issues, whether it be, you know, PED or PERS virus in swine or high path or Newcastle, different diseases going through our poultry flocks. So they're, you know, they're well experienced in our dairy herds. They, you know, they have had TB and brucellosis essentially, or maybe blue tongue, depending on the state. This is going to really be a, a, a steeper learning curve. But just like when we had to test piglets and pigs going to shows, any lactating cow, you know, we have spring shows coming. We have a spring show this weekend coming from 12 different states in the state of Wisconsin is that those cows are going to have to be tested. They're really, those show cows are are, are a lower risk. Um, but realistically, as the, those orders first come out, um, everyone's going to have to be tested. Uh, we're thinking about other larger shows like, you know, state fairs, um, you know, the whether the Jersey shows and the Holstein shows, whether they're in Pennsylvania, Kentucky, you know, and then World Dairy Expo coming. Hopefully we're not dealing with this as Dairy Expo comes back, but we're going to be prepared. Uh, we can handle it, it you know, it, and hopefully it will be old hat and then we can manage out of this. Uh, but then we'll have the experience in case something were to happen again, like foot and mouth disease. What would you say to uh, maybe encourage a farmer who they've noticed a few cows are off feed or lower in milk production fever, just have some of those symptoms? Um, what should they do? How should they proceed with that? Yep. Call your vet, call your herd vet. Um, even that though we haven't seen positive herds in Wisconsin, that's our message. And we do see a few samples here and there, even if they don't fit the case definition, right? If, they, if they're if they not, you know, a large group of animals that are, it's just a milk drop, just call, call your veterinarian. We're more than happy to do that testing to, you know, ease of mind um, to say, nope, we're ruling it out. And, but it's great to do that surveillance. So Call your veterinarian. Accredited veterinarians can take those samples for you as a good local trusted resource. Um, and it, it's not a, a state veterinarian. It's not a federal veterinarian um, that because they're busy doing other things. So it's your state, your I mean, your, your regular herd vet can can do that for you. They're a great uh, wealth of information. They're there to help you. Um, and it, uh, please, please call them and utilize them. And if, and if they don't know, they're great about calling us. You know, we're a pretty small group, the bovine veterinarians in, in the United States. Any other things though, from your perspective, um, messages you wanted to share or get across? Keep an eye on it. What's What we know now will be different than what we know even a week from now with the federal order in, in place, because we're gonna be taking and doing a lot more testing and samples. Um, you know, and then if you have questions, you know, ask.